My name is Simon Brown. Doing this evening's presentation, we're talking uh, psychology of markets, best illustrated by a very, very old uh, uh, cartoon that just shows the the hype of markets and the the fear of markets and the greed of markets. This evening, we're going to look at some of the key points and some of the ways in terms of how we manage them. It is not a case of that at the end of the evening, you will be like, cool, emotions are gone. You can't remove the emotions. We are humans. I'm going to come back to that a lot. This is how markets work. We need to understand them. We need to recognize the emotions, and we need to learn how to manage them. That's what absolutely matters. In the simplest sense, that's our top 40 index. You just sum up buy an ETF every month, debit order, buy an ETF, come back after 30 or 40 years, you have made money. A 13% return is doubling your money about every five and a half years. That creates wealth. The problem is simple, that even the ETF buyers, every time our market's down 5%, the folks who hold the ETFs are mailing me, should I panic, should I sell, is the world ending, I saw a TV show, or worse, a YouTube show, or whatever the case may be, and there's loads of panic in that regard. We've got pullbacks. So this is, <clears throat> excuse me, logarithmic because it needs to be so we can see. You know, there's the first emo emerging market crisis. That was the Asian Tigers. That was long-term capital. Uh, then we get the dot-com. We get the currency, the global financial. We get the pandemic. But what does it do? It goes bottom left, top right. And the best thing to do, truthfully, is buy that ETF every month and don't look at markets. Just ignore them. Of course, practically, that's harder to do. They've become so much more ingrained into our lives that, that the sort of uh, completely moving away and pretending nothing is happening is just not a viable option. So markets are going to test us. And the reason they're going to test us in part is that as human beings, our relationship with money is mostly negative. There's very little. I went, I went to, to ChatGPT. I said to it, please give me the 20 most frequently used idioms around money. Every single one was negative. There was no positive idiom around money. And that's just a couple of them I pulled out. And we get this, right? We, we, we throw them around. We understand it. Money is the biggest source of stress. It's one of the biggest sources of divorce in the developed world. Money causes us pain. We want more of it. We have a lot. We want still more of it. You know, the, the, uh, it's the whole, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, you know, the billionaires. I've got to be honest. I've got a billion rand. How will you know? You'll never see me again. <laughs> I promise. You want to make me go away? Billion rand. And czar. Hey, I don't even need dollars or euros. I'll take czar in that regard. It, 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 it has an over significant part of our lives. It shouldn't, but it does. And we can't change it in, in any easy way. So we need to understand that process. We need to manage that process. Just a quick thing. I've been using the DALI 3 for the images for this entire series going back to April. I've got to say, it's gotten a whole lot better. Nothing else that's better with fingers. It now typically only does five fingers. It's still, if you ask it for an image, default is white men. Like that's just, it. Dolly 3 thinks the world is white men. Um, and then if you ask for certain genders and, and races, it gets very stereotyped. But that's another story entirely. It is getting a little bit better. So why are markets about emotions? Because people are emotional, money is emotional, and markets is money and people. And we throw that together, and we're going to get the emotions. And the emotions run all the way. The emotions are when something that you've got is running, and you get panicked because, well, you should have had more, uh, and should I be selling, and what happens if it collapses? And if it's going down, you have the same emotion. I shouldn't have bought it. I'm losing money. I'm, the world is ending. There's someone out there telling you the horror stories. There always is somebody telling the horror story, usually with a little fee attached for $10, I'll solve your problem, or whatever the case may be. The market functions, in a sense, because of emotion. If we didn't have emotion, we would all look at a stock. We would do a DCF. We would agree on a fair value, DCF discounted cash flow. We would agree on a fair value for a particular stock. And we would kind of like all be trading at around that point. It is the emotions that makes markets go up and down. It, it, it's the panic, the fear, the greed that creates that volatility in the market. Without it, it would be a fairly simple bottom left, top right, if you're quality, and if not, you go bankrupt and move on. So at the very heart of markets is emotion, and therefore is the psychology, and managing it, and being sure that we know 
where we stand in that process. I go back to what I said a moment ago. We can't remove it. That part's not possible. What we need to be able to is recognize it, uh, manage it, and where possible, avoid it. But it's not going to go away. That part is just not achievable. Sellers always want max profit. Buyers want max discount. We always want a cheap share. Yeah, oh, I wish I'd bought NVIDIA at, at $50. I promise you, if NVIDIA fell to $50 tomorrow, everyone who wanted to buy at $50 would be like, oh, no, hot man, I'm not buying that. The thing is falling. But that's what you wanted. Uh, but no, I wanted to go, I want a time machine. Absent of time machine, when it goes to 50, that's when you're going to get it. So there is always going to be that process of this is what we want, and when it happens, we don't like it. We're not happy with it. We want a stock to go up tenfold, and then it does go up tenfold, and now we're panicked because, well, now what do I do? What's that sort of emotion? And then there is the hype machine. And the hype machine is media, other investors who are hyping good news and hyping bad news, especially the bad news. I've been in this market or markets for, I don't know, 30 years plus. And there is always a bunch of people who tell you that it is imminently going to crash. For my entire market career, there's been, and not just one person, a lot of people. And of course, the internet and the YouTubes and the social medias has just met, brought that news to us so much closer. The market is going to crash. Truthfully, market crashes don't particularly scare me. They used to back in the day. They don't scare me anymore now because I know this is what happens. I know markets crash. And I'm kind of suave enough now to understand that, well, a market crash is opportunity. So I remember the crash of 87. I remember the crash of, of, of uh, 98. I remember the crash of 2001. And then all of those, I messed it up, mostly because I stayed bearish for too long. I stayed panicked for too long. I refused to see that actually markets crash and then they recover. 2008 global financial crisis, I was working at Standard Bank, was the first time when I actually managed to crash well. And what that was is that September 07, because sorry, 08, the Standard Bank paid bonuses twice a year, March and September. I don't know if they still do. Not two bonuses, one bonus cut in half. Sorry, let's reiterate that <laughs> just in case you think you're working for the wrong bank. Um, so I get my bonus in what would have been, uh, I get my bonus in September 2008. Things are looking quite ugly, but uh, not too bad. And I put a whole bunch into the market and it falls a whack. So uh, September that year, get another half of my bonus. I put more into the market. It falls another whole bunch. March of 2009, I get another half bonus and I put that into the market. By now, some of the stuff I've bought is down 50%. But when I say some of the stuff, I'm talking Standard Bank, right? Was Standard Bank going bust? Look, the answer was simple. If Standard Bank went bust, it didn't matter. A, I didn't have a job anymore. But more importantly, I was queuing at Bright Bridge to get into Zimbabwe because our economy was dead and Zimbabwe was an attractive option. And then it turned out that March 2009 was the bottom. I didn't know it. But, and, and I always come back to it because I remember how badly I managed those first collapses and how in, two th in the grand uh, global financial crisis, I managed to be much more sensible about it. The trick is, truthfully, yeah, I'm part of that media. I'm part of the other investors. I was on, remember the beginning of August, we had the Japanese flash crash and I happened to be on air with Jeremy Maggs a few days later. And his first question to me was, should we be panicking? And the answer is, dude, never be panicking. The short answer, I also said to him, you know, this is just what, you know, market, it, it wasn't, it didn't feel like a, like a proper, it felt like it would recover, it did. But panic's never a viable option. We need to sort of have that cool head. We need to remind ourselves that this is what happens and how it plays out. And we need to remember that we don't know the future. The folks, I mean, there are many different ways we try and interpret the future. We look at fundamentals. We look at charts. We, my favorite is someone pulls out a chart, and again, this happens all the time. They get a chart from 1929, and they overlay the current market on it and kind of fit and say, see, it's going to happen again. Every moment on this planet is unique. Every new moment is completely unique. It's not going to happen again. Doesn't mean we won't have a bad period. Doesn't mean we won't have market collapses. Those are both certainly going to happen. But the fear mongering and the hype around it, and the hype goes both ways. The hype's on the way up and the way down. Of course, it's a whole lot more on the way down because we are poorer. We can quantifiably log into our portfolio and see, hey man, I was worth 100 bucks and now it's 50 bucks. And let's be clear, 
No one likes losing 50 bucks. No one. So what are the key fears that we as investors run into? Fear of missing out, fear of being wrong, fear of losing money, fear of exiting too early. And if we take those and sort of blend them together, we, we kind of get the, the core of what is going to be driving our emotions. I'm going to go through each of them in detail, and then I'll go through some cognitive biases, and then we'll look at some ways and how we can try and manage them and make it a whole lot better. Let's start with fear of missing out, FOMO. NVIDIA is up tenfold in two years. Tenfold in two years. That is insane. That is, I mean, I've had 10 baggers, but, you know, if a 10 bagger takes a decade, you think that's cool. NVIDIA's done it in, in, in two years. And in truth, if I went back, it's probably a hundred bagger and not many more. There are a couple of ways. So if you haven't bought NVIDIA, you're like, oh, sad, sad. Look, I bought NVIDIA very late, not even two years ago. I bought NVIDIA about a year ago. Um, but why did I buy it? I'm like, hang on, there's a story to it. So when you think that you've missed out, you've typically got two responses. One is knee jerk, let me just get in, no questions asked. The other is to be sad and never ever buy it. And for the rest of your life say, if only I'd bought NVIDIA. Or Capitec, or Didata, or whatever the particular stock in the day is. We can use charts to spot cons consolidation. I'll come to that in a second. Go find the bearish arguments. What is the argument against NVIDIA? What is the argument that says, NVIDIA is a crazy value company and has no real right to be at this price. AI is overhyped would be an argument. Uh, uh, somebody else will make another chip that will be better and superior. Um, they are overhyped. I think it is. I mean, at this point in time, if you've got a company, all you've got to do is add AR to the name and your company valuation probably goes up 10x. So in that sense, there's, it's overhyped. But in the sense of, is there something there with AI? The answer is yes. And, and I, I think AI is a bad name, artificial intelligence. It's not intelligent. It's artificial something. But there's something there. I've been using uh, Google Notebook LM. And what you do is you take content that you've got and you put it into the into the, the, the database. So you're not looking at the entire web, you're looking at a small universe. So what I did is I wrote columns for FinWeek for 12 years, two a week for 12 years, and I put those into the, the model. Now, I can't because there's a limit and I don't want to pay money, so I can only put 50 columns at a time. But I go put 50 columns in and I'm then able to query those 50 columns. So pause a moment and think, if I could take my entire corpus of work, 12 years of two columns a week, and put it into this large language model, although it would then be a small language model, I can now query my memory. In other words, I can say, what have I ever said about pick and pay? Bang, here's all my things I said about pick and pay. I can then say to it, you know, what, what have I, you know, what valuations methodologies have I spoken about? What were my critiques of them? So suddenly it's a whole, and that, so, okay, so is AI overhyped? Yes, but there's something there. Is someone else going to make a, a, a Grace Hopper 200, a Blackwell, uh, a, a, a chip, whatever, the, the, the new ones that will be coming up and going? Sure. I mean, eventually, yes. I mean, everyone is trying. Make no mistake. Arm is trying. Everyone is trying to do it. But the NVIDIA chips are not only significantly advanced on anything that the competition has got, they're also doubling their capability with every new model that comes along. They're halving their power requirements in every new model that comes along. You're now able to blend them together and make these giant effective chips. But there's a secret source that they have, the software which runs all of this. And this is freeware software, but it's owned by NVIDIA, and it only talks to NVIDIA chips. So if we make a chip that's as good as Blackwell or the Grace Hopper 200, and we go and try and sell it to Meta or Google or whoever the case may be, they're going to be, well, great, but the software that I got from NVIDIA doesn't work on it. In other words, they've got a lock-in. So it's not just making the better chip. And then you say, well, okay, let's say someone makes the better chip, and let's say someone solves the software problem, where are they going to produce it? Who's going to make this chip for them? There's only one foundry in the world that can do it. It's Taiwan, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Company. So what's their capacity to make these chips? Zero. 
because they are full making chips for video already. So could ARM do their own? Well, no, ARM don't make chips, they design chips. Could Intel do it? Sure, but Intel can't get past 12 nanometer, never mind three nanometer chips. In other words, when you start to find the bearish case for NVIDIA, you discover that there isn't much of a bearish case, which is a little worrying because I'm going to come to it in a bit. There's always a risk side to it. The next part of the equation of the third question I then asked is, what is potential future spend on these chips? And if you just go to their five biggest customers, who's essentially Microsoft for Azure, it's uh, Meta, it's uh, Alphabet, it's OpenAI, and you go look at what their, their, their CapEx budget is, basically their CapEx is going to NVIDIA. Okay, so what's their future CapEx? What's their growth on CapEx? And you start to get a picture that actually, this thing might not be expensive, never mind overpriced. There's something, so you go and hunt the negativeness of it. Now, in some examples, you're gonna go and start hunting for the negative and you're gonna find piles of things and you're gonna say, this is hysteria. I'm going to stay away from it. In this particular case, there wasn't. So it really, the people who were saying that this stock is overpriced, expensive, ridiculous, and everything else, really is just noise and haters. So then I scale into a position. I don't take everything and put it in one time. I take a third, I stick it in, and then a third a little later, and a third a little bit later. And then I buy the breakout for, from consolidation. So this is going back to July of last year, and you will notice that it already done a number of uh, le levels up. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, just here at the far left of the chart is where ChatGPT3 came out. You then, there was a long consolidation period. You see the white candle there. It breaks out beginning of uh, uh, this year. Bang. I was doing my research around about this point here, in fact, maybe a little earlier, sort of maybe April or so of last year. I then start buying in January of this year, and it runs already. So I'm buying from the breakout, and I'm buying pretty much all the way to the next consolidation. And then we get another consolidation and another breakout, and there it sits there now. In hindsight, easy. Truthfully, at that point, buying was a little bit spooky. But I'd done the work, and I'd, and I'd, I'd figured out what I liked about it. I figured out its potential futures going forward. I'd worked out its valuations within reason. I'm not the expert here on valuations. But none of this was rocket science, to my mind. And it was a case of there really, really is something here. But there was another point out there which really drove it home to me. What is the key thing around investing? Cash. Why are we buying any business? Future cash flow. That's why you buy a business. End of story. And there, the green chart bars are NVIDIA's cash flow, free cash flow per share, and the white line is the share price. On that metric, at $117, when you look at where free cash flow per share is, this stock should actually be closer to 150, 160, if you consider that it's mostly traded at a premium to cash flow. Now, maybe you want to say it should just be at cash flow, that's 140. This is what tipped me over the edge when I realized, yeah, this price is crazy, but look at this free cash flow per share. Also pretty crazy. You also notice is actually NVIDIA tracks its free cash flow per share quite closely. It gets ahead of itself sometimes. Absolutely it does. But broadly, it tracks it. So when you look at something and you think you've missed out, do the work. Get away from that FOMO. Because the problem with FOMO is it makes us do stupid things. So we remove it and we go and put the effort in and we come out with tangible, real, relatable numbers. That says in that case, NVIDIA is not too bad. And right now we could make an argument that at around 116, I think as we speak, it's trading closer to 120. Its valuation could be as high as 140, maybe even 150, 160. Not financial advice, but you see the point. And you see that process I went through to dispel the idea that this is an overhyped stock. There are times when things are overhyped. NVIDIA's growth will slow. If NVIDIA's growth continues, within about uh, 20 years' time, it's more valuable than Earth. That's a problem. It can't happen. But let's go back to the dot-com craze when Cisco, a company that basically sells routers, 
the way they were this, the, the growing, they were in seven years going to be more valuable than Earth. And I'm like, two problems. Firstly, you sell routers. Man, and it was 2000, routers were exciting, but not that exciting. And their competitive edge was nothing. Everyone makes routers. So it's the case of saying, hang on, sometimes there are bubbles. And when there are bubbles, just watch it sail on by. Don't chase a bubble. Fear of being wrong. Understand market for probability and understand that you will be wrong at times. For all of my hard work on NVIDIA, I take that back, it wasn't hard work. For all of my work on NVIDIA, I could still have been fundamentally wrong. Or I could have bought the day before a bear market started and I could have been right, but the price could still have collapsed. No one has a 100% hit rate in markets. It's just not practical. It's just not possible. We need to think in probabilities, Bayesian probability. Let me quickly touch on that, and I come up with a book at the end. I've got a list of some good books which talks around super forecasting, which talks around the Bayesian probability. Bayesian theory essentially says put things into percentages. So, you know, okay, let's take an example. Is this weekend going to be the coldest weekend in Joburg this year? Well, okay, hang on a sec. The weather department is saying, yes, it is. So that gives you a high probability of it. By this time tomorrow, we'll start getting a sense of if the weather, in fact, by this time, by tomorrow morning, we'll start getting a sense of if it's getting chilly. In other words, you start finding the evidence, ascribing percentages, and then you come back with a percentage somewhere between zero and 100. And you can do that with anything. But we don't. But why don't we? Because we can. We, that's just it. We crave that certainty. And there is no certainty. Look, there is some certainty in life. I don't know. There's certainty, death and taxes. And conservative central bankers. Especially our central banker. Love you, Gov, but yo, 25 points. We want that certainty. And, and what the Bayesian does, because you're right, we do want the certainty. What the Bayesian says to us is, except we don't have the certainty, where are we? And then it comes back to that probability versus possible. And it's the one thing that people misunderstand the whole time. Is it possible that I, in the next five seconds, fall on my face? Yes. Is it probable? Well, no. Why? Because I'm pretty good at walking. I've been walking fairly well since I was two years old or whatever. Um, my shoes are solid. The ground is flat. Possibility of my falling on my face? Yes. Probability? I would describe zero. Now, never go zero. No, but and, and that comes to the point, and you're 100% spot on. Somebody has, somebody with perfect ability to walk and everything else has fallen on their face, has broken their neck on a way to get a cup of coffee. How many? Of the 8 billion people, I would wager probably less than a handful. And we could actually run that number. So Bayesian theory can tell you, it would look at Joburg and it would tell you, using Bayesian theory, would give the probability of how many piano, pianos there are in the city. Quite easily, in fact. The first thing you do is you do a Google search for how many piano tuners are there. Then you figure, well, how often does a piano get tuned? And from that, you can suddenly get a sense of how many pianos and the probability of your being right. Bayesian theory ascribes possibility. So to your point, you are a functionally fit adult human being. You could probably do that walk a million times perfectly safely. We would need something out of the ordinary to happen. But let's take a different, because that's almost too easy, making a cup of coffee or walking up and down. Let's take something, let's take having a car accident on the way home. Right, we've driven here, it's Joburg, no one walks. So we're on our way home. What is the probability of a car accident? Well, the first question is, how far am I driving? If I'm driving, my home is about 1.1 kilometers away, but if my home was 100 kilometers away, that gives a significantly higher possibility. Have I been drinking? No, it reduces possibility. Is it nighttime? Yes, increases possibility. Uh, am I going to drive cautiously and carefully? Yes reduces possibility. Am I going to be on my phone? If I'm going to be on my phone, even if I'm hands-free, hands-free is a distraction because you're thinking about the conversation. Am I going to be taking a phone call? Yes, increases possibility. Am I going to be texting? Yes, increases it a whole lot more. Are the streetlights working? No. Well, that increases it even further. So we can start stacking up possibilities of having an accident on the way home. 
Now, it's it, it's not going to come to, it's going to say, yeah, and in the case of an accident on the way home, it's going to say, well, we ascribe a 3%. That's probably too high. We could run the numbers more, more, more stuartly to that. And that's how you start to run through that process. And to your point, it's not how we think. It's not how our brain works. Our brain likes binary. Our brain likes one or the other. Our brain likes, truthfully, certainty. We're buying a stock because we are very confident, if not certain, that it's going to be going higher. But it doesn't always. And we can crunch this and we can work this out and work to get those possibilities versus probabilities. And what is the probability? And then the really fun thing is, you've now got it. And now you can reference back to it. As pits of dark, so you on the driving on the way home, you said, well, the street lights aren't working. But actually today, City of Joburg fixed the street lights. Boom, okay, so it's actually a safer journey now. So we can adjust this because it's not fixed in time. It's changing every single second. It's constantly going to be adapting as circumstances around it change. And it's the same in the stock market. Yeah, uh, NVIDIA got sued for antitrust. Well, no. They got a letter to say that they're being investigated. Did that change things? Yes. Markedly? No. Can you really be bust for being a monopoly when it's just that you're better than everybody else? Is the US very good at breaking up monopolies? Not, I mean, they've basically broken up two, one in the 80s, one in the 20s. And when I say the 20s, the 1920s, not the 2020s. So I get that, you know, I look at this, and what's the market knee-jerk response? Sell off NVIDIA 9%. Next three days, what does NVIDIA do? Regrain, regain the 9% as people start working through, well, is it possible that they get broken up? Sure. Is it probable? No. It's not their fault that their competition is useless. The U.S. is useless at uh, uh, breaking up monopolies. What would the remedy be anyway? You must give people access to your software. The software is freeware. Running through that process, understanding those differences, understanding point by point, breaking it down into small little steps. I talk around goal setting when, often, and I talk around don't have giant audacious goals, have small little bite-sized goals. And this process is very much the same. And it is, to come back to your point, it's a skill set we need to teach ourselves and learn and then have the discipline to constantly do. Because as humans, we want certainty, and as humans, we snap to judgment. We make quick decisions, and we think it's our skill set. The ability to make quick decisions we think is a good thing. It's not. Because we're making quick decisions based on not having all the data, based on emotion, based on how we feel, and based on what everyone else is doing. Wisdom of the crowd. Or foolishness in many cases. So it's not a comfortable space for us. It's not a natural place that we do. But it makes us significantly better thinkers and as better, in, in particular niches, and as better thinkers, we're inherently going to get better results. It also helps remove fear. It helps remove panic. It helps remove FOMO. It makes us understand what we're dealing with. And then, as I said, when you're wrong, it helps you go back. It was Sepa Madiba who once said to me, I was talking to him about uh, discounted cash flow. Certain, but there's so many variables you've got to put in and make decisions on. And he says it's brilliant. Because then when you get results in six months and you were wrong, you can see exactly where you were wrong and you can interrogate why you were wrong. And you can make a better a better model going forward. Plan, process, discipline. And understanding what your edge is. Your edge isn't that you're the smartest person or you do more research or faster or are richer. Your edge is discipline. Your edge is repeatability of process. That's what makes you successful. That ability to say, I have a process which I trust, which I understand, and which I fully implement, and I can then repeat it. 
because otherwise you bought something and it did great and then you're like well that was fun but how do i do it again and again and again so ultimately the edge is you and that process and always be looking for the risks always be looking for the negatives always be looking for what is bad when i'm looking at a stock and i'm going to talk about it more in a moment i write down a list of the good things i write down a list of the bad things i actively hunt out the bad things and there have to be bad things if i can't find the bad things there's a problem because there's nothing is only positive there's always risks on the other side we have to find them and then critical document documented ideally write by hand no one's going to do that our brain when we write our brains believe and remember they've done tests with university students those who are doing laptops and and and, and uh, uh, ipads and that sort of thing have about a third the memory capacity of those who've written by hand just that process of writing works better with our brain now no one writes by hand anymore, but still document it. So you can reference back to it. Hugely important, document it. Particularly when things go pear-shaped or when they go well. But what happens is five years down the line, you're like, why did I own NVIDIA again? Well, there's a folder on my computer that tells me. Fear of losing money. Welcome to markets. The good news for an investor is that your downside is capped at 100%. You buy a share, it goes to zero, you've lost 100%. Nasty, but it's only 100%. The good news is that the upside is not capped. If you'd bought two shares two years ago, and one of them was, I don't know, a terrible share, and one was NVIDIA, the terrible share has gone to zero, and NVIDIA is up 10x, you've made nine times your money. Extreme example, I know. But that is what markets are, upside uncapped, downside 100%. Now, of course, you need a diverse portfolio. That doesn't work if you have a binary portfolio. But you put 20 stocks into a portfolio, you're going to have one or two mistakes. You're going to have the occasional Steinhoff. Let's quickly go to Steinhoff. In its heyday, I remember the number of times on TV, do you own Steinhoff? Do you like Steinhoff? My answer was always no. Oh, but why not? It's a great company. Marcus Just is a genius. I'm like, yes to all of that. But I can't understand their results. And I tested myself once. And let's be clear, I'm not a chartered accountant. I'm not the smartest kid in the room. But I understand a balance sheet should balance, and I understand the debt side. So what did I try and do? I tried to reconcile the debt. That's all. Not even the whole balance sheet. I just tried to reconcile the debt. And after about a week of tying myself in knots, I'm like, I, I, I don't know what's happening here. I just don't know what's happening here. At this point, Steinhoff is about a 20 rand share. So what do I do? Nothing. Goes to 90 bucks. Why haven't you bought Steinhoff? I don't understand. I I, it, it makes no sense to me. And it turned out that, that Marcus Juster was a gold medalist at accounting. It also turns out he was a drug cheat gold medalist at accounting and that took his medal away. And I've been wrong times it before. You know, the number of times on the Steinhoff story, and I remember particularly at the green room at uh, CNBC and, and Business Day TV, sitting with other folks who are trying to convince me I'm wrong, and I leave with a compelling, Yo, I am so wrong, I should buy some Steinhoff. And then I open up my Steinhoff folder again. And I'm like, but I don't understand the debt. And maybe it's just because I'm stupid. But I gotta at least I gotta it's gotta make sense to me. And if it doesn't make sense to me, then I can't do it. And there are companies and I've forgotten them. Of course I have, because what's my brain done? The ones when I couldn't understand the debt and there was no cheat, and it did go to the moon. I've deleted that one out of my brain. Yeah, so it's a great question. It's not a gut thing. I don't, my, my gut is good at one thing and that's telling me that was a good bunny char. I just come back from Durban. There are the man, Durban is heaven. Anyway, it's not a gut thing because it's it, it, not easy, not easy. And let me be very, very clear. 
back in the day, late 90s, early 2000s, I'm on chat forums, I'm getting into the stock market he thing. Man, I was there following every new fad. Um, and it starts to come with, I think I just got burnt too many times. And then I'm like, I'm losing fingers. And it's because someone called Harry the Hippo on an internet website told me to buy this thing. That just seems stupid. But to the point of how do I stand my ground when in the green room when everyone else is saying you should be buying it? I lie. No, I, because I can't. Because I can't argue with them. Because they chartered accountants. They've got degrees and CFAs, levels one, two, three, and who knows how many. So what I say to them is, that makes perfect sense. Let me go home and buy some Steinhoff. And truthfully, I probably believe that. And then I get home and I open my document and I'm like, Aish, I can't do this. I can't do this. And there probably are times when I have been swayed. I mean, let's be clear, I'm not the superhuman here. There probably are times when I have been swayed, and sometimes they might have worked, sometimes they didn't. Courage or conviction, very easy to say, immensely hard to do. Very, very hard, particularly when the thing's just going up and up and up. And then I'm a nasty oak. When it goes that way, man, I go back to people and say, I told you so. <laughs> but it is hard. So. The best way, the best solution in that is to isolate yourself from the noise. Now, it's harder for me because I'm in green rooms and studios and stuff like that. Green rooms, the room you sit in before you go on, on air. It's harder if you're in that sort of environment. My problem is, you know, if I rate my sort of 10 best friends, probably seven of them want to talk markets. You're much better if you're 10 best friends, none of them know what a market is. Now, that's not something you can manage, but certainly it is ultimately noise. I'm just trying to manage that part of the noise. For traders, it's a stop loss. I'm not even going to go go look at Mishima's video from last month. Go look at the, the trading as a side hustle video as well. It's portfolio structure. In other words, traders, it's 2% rule. For individuals, it's you don't put all your money into one share. We know that you have a diverse portfolio. You have ETFs at the core. For me, it's about 55, 60% broad diverse ETFs. And then around that, I put a dozen or so death to us part shares. And then around that, I put half a dozen or so individual stocks, which I will hold ungeared for potentially years if they keep on going in the right direction. Know what you bought. Comes back to that folder I talk about. Know why you buy it. Know what the attraction is. Know what the risks are. Monitor it to see if they change. What I never did with Steinhoff, and in hindsight, I should have. I should have gone back and retried to do the debt for two reasons. One, maybe I was getting smarter. And two, maybe it was changing. But I didn't. I, I, and I don't know why I didn't. But I, I, I have, about two or three years ago, I went back to my Steinhoff document, and it was a case of, I, you know, I realized that I tried to reconcile the debt once and never gone back to it. I probably should have. Because we're talking, you know, this is years before it collapsed in that December, what was it, 2017. You will have losers. You will be wrong. It's not fun. Particularly when you've gone through a process. Particularly when you've put everything together. You think you solved the problem. And then you realize, I still lost money. That's going to happen. Sometimes it's because of outright fraud and lies and trickery. Sometimes it's because of bad research. Sometimes it's because things have changed. You will have losers. That's just part of it. And sometimes it's losers because you sell too early or sell too late. Sometimes it's losers because you buy the wrong stock. And that's painful in all of those examples because there's only one person. I mean, you know, when Steinhoff goes bust, you blame Marcus and you lose money. Do you blame Marcus Yester or do you blame yourself? We all blame Marcus Yester. It's wrong. I mean, yes, he's the criminal. But you bought it. No one put a gun to your head. Exiting early. <laughs> The big money is made in the big winners. The big money is made in the 10 baggers. That's how fundamentally changes portfolios. Fun fact, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, as of his last set of results, would be underperforming the S&P 500 if he hadn't bought Apple and watched it go up five-fold whilst he owned it. If I look back at my investing career over, say, 20 years, 
there are a few stocks that have fundamentally benefited my portfolio. Buying Capitaker 20 is one of them. In fact, I take that back. Buying Capitaker 20 is a game changer. Capitec's now 3,000. Letting those winners run. And how do you do that? You got a document. You go back to what you like about it. You ignore Viceroy Research and their claims about it because what they're accusing Capitec of is knowledge that is known. It's been in the market. Financial Mail had written a, a, a front page article about it two years before Viceroy Research arrived on the scene. Investors, let them run. Expect pullbacks. Know what you bought. Keep checking your thesis. How's it doing relative to peers? Importantly, keep checking your thesis. Also understand, when I held Capitec, at one point it was 175, then it was 125. It stayed 125 rand for two or three years. Years. And I'm still, but like this thing is eating everybody's lunch. Now, I did not expect Capitec to get to 20 million accounts. That never occurred to me. I thought 5 million would be a giant number. I never expected it to almost overtake Standard Bank in terms of market capitalization. That just even today sounds crazy. But again, you've got that diverse portfolio. What often happens, and I give another example, I bought Combined Motor Holdings a couple of years ago and it went sideways for three and a half years. But they were paying me a dividend. So the sideways is less painful. The problem when Capitec or CMH is going sideways is lots of other things aren't. You can, and I have fallen into this trap, you can scale out of a position. It becomes too big in your portfolio, so you sell some down, which makes a lot of sense. You're protecting profit. But it also meant that I sold some Capitex at about 220 Rand because they were 40% of my portfolio. It's a 10-bagger since when I sold some. And I've chatted with lots of people around this, fund managers, Goth McKenzie. How do you manage what becomes a ridiculously outsized position? And it goes back to going back to your research, going back to what you've got, understanding why it's an attractive. And at points, Capitec has been expensive, and at points, it's actually been relatively cheap. And the fact that it might be expensive at a certain point doesn't mean you need to panic and sell it. Because either earnings will catch up or the price will come down. But as long as it's growing, as long as it does what it says, what is the beauty around Capitec? Well, their cost to income is around 38%. The big banks are 52. Boom. They make 14% per rand more than the other banks. Why? Because they started as an asset light business. I'm chatting with uh, 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 Hilton Kono tomorrow from Discovery Bank. They're going to have a cost to income in the mid-20s because they don't even do branches. They just do apps. So, so what was the Capitec versus the big banks? It wasn't the fancy branding. The, the cheap accounts and everything helped. It was their cost base and their control. Capitec can say, you know what? We've got too much exposure to Gandhi Square. Commuters going through Gandhi Square. Let's turn off the taps a bit in Gandhi Square. That granularity. They also say to the, to the branch managers, you decide opening times. I was at Gandhi Square once with my then director from Standard Bank. There are four banks, seven o'clock in the morning. They're all closed, except Capitec. Why? Because at seven o'clock in the morning, Gandhi Square is packed with thousands of commuters. African Bank, I oh, know, we're closed. We open at half past eight, nine, because we are bankers. Sure, but your commuters aren't bankers. Cognitive biases. <laughs> There are hundreds, there are thousands of these. Confirmation bias. You believe information that confirms what you currently believe. Human nature 101. You think that the Sharks are the best rugby team in the entire universe. Every piece of information that comes around the Sharks just proves that point. Someone comes and tells you about the WP Drizzlers and you're like, nah, that's nonsense. It's about the Sharks. We interpret information to fit our belief. 
it's easy to solve. Actively go look for stuff that contradicts your view. Actively go and listen and watch videos and stuff that contradicts your view. And again, have that document. And in that document, have the bad things as well as the good things. But you have to actively hunt out the stuff that makes you uncomfortable. Because human nature will see it coming and duck. Loss aversion. We fear losses more than we fear winners. Means we don't cut our losers, and it means, more importantly, is we sell our winners too quickly. We are too keen to lock in that profit. We are too keen to, ah, oh, I've made 10%, let's sell it. That one's down 50%. Oh, but it's still lovely. I don't want to be selling that loser one. Because you want the emotional thrill from the winner, you don't want it from the guy. Again, have predefined exits, have predefined plans, have your Bayesian theory, have your notes which say to you, at this point, it's up 10, and that's nice, but there's no reason to sell. Or, this thing's down 40%, and at this point, I'm not selling because my, my, my thesis is still broadly intact. I've never held a share to zero, but I like to think that I would. And I know that's a weird thing to say, but I like to think that if I had the confidence in my thesis, I would say to the market, nah, I'm trusting myself. Partly because I've got that security net of it can only go to zero. Whereas on the way up, there's no, ups, there's no cap on the limit. Recency bias, we give more importance to things that have just happened and we ignore things further back in the past. This is why we take notes. This is why we refer back to our notes. This is why I can go and tell you what I was thinking about ShopRite in 2004 when I first bought it. Because I still have that Excel, which is, and I haven't upgraded the file format. It is Excel 97, I think, file format. Which weirdly, it still saves as. No questions asked. Well, actually, no, it's. Microsoft. Lots of questions asked, but it saves us. It's critically important that we look back in time. And I know the further the time gets away, the less it matters. Now, Dart, what I thought about ShopRite in 2004 is truthfully not massively important to ShopRite in 2024, but it's there. Because it's easy, right? It's, it's just data on, on, on a hard drive. Um, endowment effect, because we own it, it's got to be the best thing in the world. I drive the best car, I live in the best city, I eat the best food, I drink the best whiskey, because I'm Simon. And you're laughing because you think, no, no, dude, you drive the best car, and you have the best whiskey, and you live in the best city. You see how these are simple little things, which when I say it, it's like, well, of course it's the best car. For goodness sake, I bought it. Would I buy a B-grade car? Who would do that? Who would live in a B-grade city? So it, it, it's our brain playing with us. Objectiveness. Every company needs to be able to stand. Every investment needs to be able to stand on its own legs. It needs to be able to say, yes. And there's a nice trick. If the price was right, would you still buy it? To every investment. The price is right. Uh, let's take ShopRite, for example. Okay, 305, ShopRite's expensive. 270, 80, fairly valued. If ShopRite's 280 tomorrow, would I buy some? Answer, yes. Cool, then I'll hold ShopRite. Framing effect. How we look at something. Market's down 10%. Is that a crash in the end of the world or is it an opportunity? And that depends on how you feel, on how you woke up this morning, on how the media is playing it. Anything, there are two sides to that coin. We have to decide which side we're going to focus on. And what it is, is how do we decide? Well, truthfully, we don't. We look at it and we say, well, 10% down, you know, again, back to your thesis, again, back to your Word document or Excel spreadsheet. Actually, I, you know, so I always use Excel, not Word, just because I like the, you can't format in Word. You know when you put an image in Word and then you move it two millimeters? 
Yeah. It didn't move two millimeters, did it? It's now on page 73. You didn't know there were 73 pages. Oh, yes, there is. And now there's an image on it, and you're never going to find it again. <laughs> Understand that if you're looking at a market at 10% down and panicking, there's another side to the coin, which is, well, hey, stuff just got 10% cheaper. Everything has another side of the coin. Find the other side of the coin. Now you've got to decide which side you're going to agree with. But oftentimes, the side that we're directly attracted to is the one that's bad for us because it's the one that is being hyped. Understand the dirty secret around this industry. And when I say this industry, I mean money. There's a lot of people making a lot of money off money. But they only make money off money when it moves. When it moves, they grab a bit for fees. They grab a bit for this. They grab a bit for that. As the money moves, they make fees. This entire industry needs money to move. It needs you to panic. It needs you to sell too early. If we all just bought an ETF on the first of the month, every month, the rest of our life, 90% of this industry would be out of a job myself included. We need money to move because when it's moving, you can take a fee. Now, of course, the industry is very clever. Sometimes money isn't moving. They still take a fee. It's called banking. Anchoring bias. First piece of information we see becomes the most important piece of information that we've seen. And we just fixate on that particular piece. It's the only thing that matters. Again, it goes back to the reassessing. Again, it goes back to being inquisitive and saying, no, 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 no. I want lots more pieces of information. One isn't enough. Bring me more data. Bring me more things to think about. And determine your own waiting, because your brain is going to say first thing. It's that thing, don't judge a book by its cover. With respect, how else do we judge a book? Don't judge, you know, we make an impression on a person typically within the first three seconds, which means we're making an impression on how they look and how they stand, their gender, their race. All of those are wrong, but it's what's hardwired into us as human beings. We have to actively look beyond it. We have to actively pick up the book and read the blurb or find a review or speak to a person or interrogate the information that we have. Buy, sell, hold. At some point in your life, it's probably happened already, maybe many times, you're going to have a stock, you're going to want to buy it, but it is too expensive, and you're going to say, you know what, as soon as this thing loses 30%, I'm in like Flynn. And then it loses 30%, and you're like, whoa, I didn't mean 30, I meant 35. Falling stocks. Might be Steinhoff, but let's be very clear. You note that when I'm giving you examples of disaster shares on the JSC, I'm quoting Steinhoff. Okay, I could throw African Bank into it, but my list is very short. The list of winners, we don't have time this evening to go through. So sometimes it is a Steinhoff, sometimes it is an African Bank. Most times, it's just a pullback. And I remember, and I was on air, and I remember I was chatting with uh, 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 Naveen Naya from Sasfin. ShopRite hit 100 Rand during the pandemic. And you know what the two of us did live on air? We talked ourselves out of buying it. Why? Because people are stupid. <coughs> Things now 300. We were worried, was Peter Enelbrecht, you know, was he going to be half as good as Mr. Basson? Oh, but this and that. We weren't worried that the pandemic was going to end the world. We weren't worried that people would stop eating. We were worried that somehow, because of a pandemic, ShopRite was going to lose their mojo. As I said, we were stupid. Seven minutes, live on air, we talked ourselves out of buying ShopRite at 100. With respect to him, he phoned me about two weeks later or three weeks later, it was 120. He said to me, we were stupid and I'm buying it. And I'm like, cool, crunched my numbers, me too, buying some more. Shares come down as opportunity. 
unless something has fundamentally changed. Okay, back to the research. But invariably, prices go up to expensive, prices go down to cheap. We like cheap. It sells off when you worry. Know what makes you sell. Quick, ShopRite. What do I love about ShopRite? They have absolute mind share of the consumer of just being caring about us as consumers. And that used to be pick and pay. It used to be Raymond Ackerman. Way back in the day. It's now ShopRite. And how do we know that? Two examples. I go to my local shop right, they will sell me a chicken wrap and a coffee. I think it's 35 Rand. And I know that there's no way they the chicken wrap and coffee, like not 35. I mean, the Wimpy across the way will sell me a chicken wrap and a coffee for a hundred bucks. Why is it 35? Because mm, they want my mind share, they want my foot traffic. And then if you go to a shop right, which is the blue collar. Depending where they are, they'll sell you a lunch for five rand or ten rand. And that person buying it knows that it costs more than five or ten rand to make this because they make it sometimes. But that's not the key reason. The key reason is out of supermarket chains in the world with more than a thousand stores, the median operating profit margin is 2.4 and ShopRite is 5.4. They are measurably perhaps the best grocery retailer on planet Earth. And their distribution network is insane. Their DCs, which they started, ShopRite was doing DCs before Walmart was doing distribution centers. And then their innovation, Checkers 6060. Americans look at Checkers 6060 and think, now there, Amazon Fresh, it's limited availability. You got to order a delivery slot four hours in advance and the delivery slot is four hours in duration. There is no tracking your driver. They will randomly knock, knock on your door. Come on, man. That is like 2019 when we live in the post-pandemic world. So now what makes you sell? And it is invariably not price dependent. My long-term investments, I never sell because of price. If I'm investing well. Some books. Trading in the zone, Mark Douglas. It is more trading than investing, but it's got some really good thoughts. Thinking fast and slow is absolutely critical. Our brains make snap decisions. They're nearly always the wrong decision. We need to slow down. I often talk around doing things when markets are closed. I'll come to that in a second. Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. I've just bought his new book. I forget the name. I haven't read it yet, but that's, sorry? Same as ever. Full bar random by Talib, full bar, sorry, full bar randomness. Luck plays a significant part. It absolutely does. Uh, don't read Talib's other books. They should mostly be flyers, not books. And super forecasting, that is Bayesian theory. So avoid making decisions when markets are open, or at least not when they're watching. Do not be making mark a decision where on the one side, you've got a chat group of market participants and CNBC, and here's live prices. You are not making sane, intelligent decisions. You are being buffered by people who want you to act, because when you act, money moves, they make money, CNBC gets advertising. I don't begrudge them their advertising. I work for a radio, a TV station but I understand that process. Back in the day, before I was sort of at the coal face of markets, I would make my decisions on weekends and place the orders on the weekend. And then some will wait for things to happen. I'm sort of no longer afforded that luxury, but the worst thing to be doing is watching a share fall or rise and at the same time, quickly updating your thesis. Not gonna work. Have a simple process, develop a disciplined approach. This is not rocket science. We can make it rocket science. And there are people out there who absolutely are smart enough to do that. But most of us have skill sets that sit somewhere else. And this is, and I'm not belittling it, this is a side hustle, a hobby in a sense. We don't have 40 hours a week, most of us, to put into this. We need to keep it simple, but we need to have that process and it needs to be disciplined. Learn to recognize and mitigate your biases. The emotions don't go away. Making mistakes doesn't stop. 
we get better at managing it, we get better at recognizing it, and we perhaps make fewer of them. And when you're making decisions, so I, <laughs> when I'm about to do a buy or sell, typically I will pause and I'll go have a cigarette. I know, terrible. But I go away from the screen, just for five minutes. Let me go do something else. Then let me come back. Hey, look what I was doing. Is this a good idea? Just snap that process for half of, no, five minutes. So that when you come back, you're fresher and you can rethink that process. And when you make mistakes, and we will, and when we are driven by emotion, and it will happen, deconstruct it. It was a trick I was taught, and now I can't remember who taught it to me. But you know how we go back and we revisualize an, an experience or an event that we've happened? The mistake is we always revisualize it in our body. <clears throat> Sit in a corner of the room and try and watch yourself doing it. What was that process? I do it a lot. I play a lot of poker. I do that a lot with my poker. I, I make a, something really, really stupid. Okay, let me stand over here and re-watch me do it again stupid. Trying almost to be a neutral third party. Easier said than done, but it's a skill we can learn. Always look for both sides. Every coin, two sides. Every story, two sides. Everything, two sides. And I'm not for a second saying that the other side has a valid argument. Just because they exist. They're not always nice people, to quote an orange person. Check your emotions. Check when they're running wild. When they're running wild, shut it down. In other words, don't shut your emotion down. Shut the computer down. Do not, if you are, if you can recognize that you are feeling emotional, don't do anything. Your body is coursing with adrenaline. You might be making the right decision. But you might very well not be making the right decision. And I understand this is a continual improvement. This is not a mountain where one day we get to the top and we are like, ha ha, I are top a mountain. You are climbing this mountain forever. This is a continual ongoing process, not just at improving, but in checking yourself and sort of bringing yourself back on course. Because it's not like a mountain which is straight up, it's like a proper mountain which is up and down and up and looks like a stock market. Things will be good, things will be less good. Keep on evaluating, keep on going back to the decisions which we've made, keep on understanding why did we make them. And do that for the bad ones and the good ones. Constantly be reevaluating. I used to do it when flying. So I do two things in airplanes. 98% of the time, I sleep. But the other part of the time, I used to just, I would go through things I'd done and review and revisit. Because there were no screens, there is no internet, there's just this drumming noise and a tiny uncomfortable chair. And you will make mistakes. We are humans. Mistakes are written into our DNA. Don't beat yourself up about it. If you want to be cliched, use it as an opportunity to learn and grow. And that's overly cliched, but you get the point. We will make mistakes. We're never going to be totally perfect at this. <clears throat> 